Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the session number five or the second day of uh, Healthy Living with HIV workshop. My name is David Dillick uh, and it's my great pleasure to chair this session for August on Access. Our session is divided in two parts. After each of one, we will have a Q&A part. So please participate, be active and don't uh, hesitate and feel free to send our questions to uh, a chat box. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, invite our first speaker, uh, Dr. Julia Del Amo from Spain. Uh, she's director of a national plan of HIV and SDI and uh, at the Ministry of Health of Spain. And she was also active in research. So please, uh, her state of the art lecture called Maximizing PrEP Use and Retention at the National Level. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk on maximizing PrEP use and retention at the national level. I will address how to maximize PrEP use and retention at the national level. By addressing each of the points in this slide, we need to build a case for PrEP based on public health and health economics. We need to understand figures on HIV, new infection and PrEP impact. We need to understand, and this is very important, I want to stress, the context where we want to maximize PrEP use and retention and build alliances that are strategic to our setting. And this involves involving alliances with politicians, with policymakers, those working in the HIV field, but also in general public health, involve clinical societies, patients, associations and NGOs, academia and industry, and involve all these possible actors in decision making and accountability. Regarding the first point, building a case for PrEP based on public health principles and on health economics, it is important to build a case of PrEP need within the 2030 Sustained Development Goals. You're aware of the 17 Sustained Development Goals expected by 2030 and how goal three involves good health and well-being and within these targets we have ending AIDS by 2030 and we have a number of targets like zero new infections that's a 90% reduction in the new infections together with zero AIDS deaths and zero discrimination. By 2030, by 2020, sorry, we had a number of targets which involved the reduction of new HIV infections to fewer uh, to than 500,000. And in 2016, a political declaration on ending AIDS by UN AIDS recommended the initiation of three million people on PrEP by 2020. Where are we now? Well, if we look at figures in the global PrEP tracker, we can see that in the third quarter of 2020, just under 800,000 people were initiated on PrEP. So well beyond well below, sorry, the 3 million people uh, for 2020 recommended by UNAIDS, still a long way to go in increasing the number of PrEP initiatives. If we move to the second item, understanding figures from other countries on HIV new infections, um, how PrEP has impacted either in a positive way or in a less positive way. And um, I do not have time in this 15 minutes talk to go into the HIV epidemiology, but it is important that you go into that when you try to develop your case for PrEP in your setting. 
I will go through the trends in the numbers of PrEP initiators in different settings to draw conclusions. So when we look at the overall number of PrEP initiators worldwide, we can see in the darkest blue the countries with the highest absolute numbers of PrEP initiators. We see United States of America with just over 200,000 people initiated on PrEP. And we also see very high numbers in South Africa with close to uh, 90,000 people and Kenya with over 72,000 people. But if we look at trends over time in the United States and South Africa, we see very different trends. And we can see that while in South Africa, numbers are increasing in the United States. The curve has blunted from 2018 numbers, and it is important to understand why these numbers are not increasing as we reach all people in need of bread or are we reaching a vulnerable group or a more difficult group to access bread. This is very important that each of us looks at our context to understand why. When we look at numbers in Europe, things are slightly different in magnitude, and I would like I would like to focus on two countries: France, which is the first country that incorporated bread funding to public um, reimbursement to uh, full reimbursement of bread provision to bread users, and the earliest one and the current number of prepuses in France is 23,500 and the UK with 18, just over 18,000 people on prep. And when we look at trends over time, we see that in both countries numbers are increasing, which is reassuring. Um, when we look at two other countries, and I will focus on Spain, my country, which has introduced reinvestment of PrEP in the public uh, uh, system in the national healthcare only a year ago, we see that our numbers are increasing, although the magnitude, as you can see, is uh, low, and uh, we've got just under 2,500 people on PrEP for a large population. When we compare these figures with the Netherlands country with a smaller amount of, uh, with a, a smaller population, we see how the number of people in PrEP, which also started rising only in 2019, when it was uh, publicly funded, it has increased very rapidly with 4,500 people in there. So, very different contexts, which are important to understand. And this takes me to the third point on the importance of understanding context. And the first context, the, the, the first issue that is important to address are the barriers to prep use and retention which in many occasions have universal aspects that are common to all settings, but in others are context specific. I want to highlight this excellent paper published this year, 2020, by Ken Mayer and colleagues, addressing, an, uh, a, 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 in a narrative review, addressing barriers to wider use of PrEP in the United States. And they focus on key barriers and they uh, propose potential approaches to removing these barriers. Um, some of the barriers uh, addressed in this narrative review are universal, such as awareness of death, or low HIV risk perceptions, or stigma. Some are more content specific, like the provider of bias and the distrust of healthcare system, which are very setting specific, also within a given country, or access to medical care because it depends on how um, 
medical uh, funding and national health care services, whether they are available or not, how this is structured, this will very much influence uh, how PrEP uptake and retention works in various settings. And of course, lack of access to financial assistance or fear to side effects are aspects that also need to be addressed. And because of issues, because of time constraints, I will not address the potential approaches to removing these values, but I suggest that you read this paper. I want to thank Timo Nuri, a colleague and friend from the European Centre for Disease Control, for providing me these very updated slides of 19th of November this year, which summarizes the status of formal prep implementation in Europe and how funding or reimbursement is available. You can see in blue countries where PrEP in Europe is not formally implemented, largely in Eastern Europe, and in various degrees of green countries where in the darkest green, a PrEP is nationally avail available, and in the lighter green, where generics are available, and this obviously facilitates um, PrEP uptake by various groups. And understanding how PrEP is reimbursed in various settings is definitely a key issue for understanding the PrEP gap. And this is another paper that I recommend that you also read, is the PrEP gap among men who have sex with men in Europe. And this is a paper by a colleague from, led by ECDC with other colleagues that addresses the difference between the proportion of MSM participating in the IMI survey that responded that they were taking PrEP in green with the proportion of MSM who responded would be very likely to use PrEP if it was available for them. And these proportions range from 45% in the PrEP gap in countries in the east part of Europe, where you could uh, remember from the previous slide, PrEP was not available, to a lower proportion in the PrEP gap in countries where PrEP was available. These figures are 2017, so things hopefully have improved a lot for many of the countries where PrEP programs are being implemented. Although uh, the PrEP gap in Europe uh, was estimated to be of 17% in 2017, and I really think this PrEP gap has decreased, although as you can see there is substantial heterogeneity by countries that needs to be addressed. And which issues limit PrEP implementation in European countries? Well, the cost of the drug, limited technical capacity and cost of service delivery were among the most important limiting factors. It is important to address the impact of the COVID pandemic in PrEP, and I have selected these two papers which I recommend to read, how in Australia up to 25% of PrEP users change stopped daily PrEP and 5% change to on-demand PrEP, largely because they had stopped using causal uh, um, uh, capsule uh, um, uh, sex during the lockdown or whether they had decreased the number of casual partners. Finally, I want to thank ECDC for moving forward with this operational guidance on PrEP, which will be published in the first quarter of 2021, where they develop a minimum set of standards for PrEP service delivery in Europe and they will focus on the case for PrEP as a policy play, and they will also address country case studies that will help different European countries to implement PrEP in the various settings. So thank you 
to the colleagues within this important work. Finally, I want to stress the importance of building alliances that make sense in our setting. And to do this, I want to highlight how we worked with various uh, health actors involved in health governance and decision making in Spain, where we collectively incorporated PrEP to public funding a year ago. And this involved various sectors from the Ministry of Health, the National Committee on Public Health, the National Committee on Digital Coordinators, all NGOs, all various actors, and finally politicians. And I want to remind ourselves of this important proposition not of law supported by the Health Commission, the Spanish Parliament, supported by all political parties. Thank you very much. Dr. Delamo, thank you very much for your presentation. Please stay with us until the Q&A session. And for you in the audience, please feel free to send us uh, messages for discussion. Now is the time to move to second presentation by Dr. Pep Cole. Pep Cole is a clinical cohorts coordinator at Ershikasha uh, AIDS Research Institute in Spain, and also works as a as a clinician at the Badalona University in Spain. Uh, he's focused on strategies and prevention of HIV and other STIs. Uh, uh, his presentation is called Long-Term Impacts of PrEP, How to Reduce Toxicity and Resistance. Dr. Pep Cole, please. Good afternoon. First of all, I like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this session. I'm going to talk about impacts, long-term impacts of PrEP, specifically uh, about toxicity and resistance, TMI disclosures. The agenda for my presentation is first uh, to talk about toxicity of available drugs for PrEP, then uh, see whether we can reduce toxicity with other drugs and then talk about risk of resistance to PrEP. Is it high? Can we, can we reduce it? First, safety and uh, of available drugs for PrEP. The first one the, for all PrEP, as you know, is the FTC TDF, the Truada, which has shown low toxicity in clinical trials. We know that it can be decreased in bone mineral density around one percent, but no increased fractures observed. And also we, we know that they can decrease the GFR, which usually is reversible. Uh, it's true that uh, probably there is no enough of time in these clinical trials to detect uh, long-term toxicities. But on the other hand, we have uh, quite a lot of experience with people with HIV around uh, treatment with, with these drugs. And also it is possible to reduce doses of these drugs with on-demand PrEP. And it's true that PrEP is not forever. Usually you can be on PrEP for a long period, but not for the whole life. And there is another PrEP option available uh, in, not in Europe, not yet in Europe, because the, is not yet approved by the European Medicine Agency, which is the uh, FTC TAF, which is not inferior to FTC TDF for HIV prevention, and it's been shown in the Discover study. But efficacy evidence is only in MSM and transgender women, and there are no studies with on demand regime. This is the a presentation of the last results of the Discover study in the last Troy conference, the results of the week 96. And I will not spend much time on that, just this is the overall site is uh, summary. Uh, we can see that in both arms the, there were similar adverse events. And we look at the bone, uh, we see that the TAF, as we, we knew, the FTC TAF, uh, it's the bone safety, uh, it's uh, more, uh, it's, it's higher with the FTC TAF rather than the 
FTC TDF. The same with uh, regarding the renal safety, uh, better with the uh, FTC TAF, as we knew. And when we look at the lipids, we see that uh, in this case, the FTC TDF uh, can decrease the lipids uh, more than the the FTC TAF. When we look at the fasting glucose, no differences, and the same for the total cholesterol HDL ratio. Also, we, the, the, we don't see differences between both. When we look at the body weight, we know that with the TAF, uh, there can be an increase of weight in, in this study, it was 1.7 kilos, uh, the median body weight increase, and it's, the difference is statistically significant with the uh, TDF, uh, FTC. And uh, let's see other drugs. And recently, the European Medicine Agency has adopted a positive opinion for the lapivirine vaginal ring. This is based on the studies, these are uh, open label studies of uh, <coughs> voice and ring. It's the HOPE and DREAM studies showing an estimated efficacy of 54%. And with a with a good uh, safety profile, the, the most common side effects are urinary tract, in, tract infection or vaginal discharge or pruritus or pelvic uh, low abdominal pain, but we know that the, there is very low systemic uptake in social. Uh, this, uh, the recommendation for the European Medicine Agency is exclusively for markets outside the European Union. And another advantage of this is the multipurpose technology. We can add a contraceptive for this vaginal ring, which could make more appealing for women, for some women. And other drugs, the, the same, the, the, the Dapivirin vaginal ring. There are studies with rectal Dapivirin gel, is the study MTN026. Do, we don't have results yet, but based on the vaginal ring, gel and ring studies, the rectal formulation of the pivirin is expected to be also safe. Now let's go to another uh, drug, another formulation. Uh, we, we saw the results of the HPTN OA3 in the last uh, AIDS conference in July. And it's, uh, yeah, I'm sure that my colleague, uh, Dr. Landovitz will talk much um, in much more deeply than me in the next presentation. But just to remember that this study in one with uh, around 4,500 participants and half of them received the capotegravid long acting injectable every two months and the uh, rest uh, oral prep with TDF FTC. Uh, regarding the injection uh, adverse events, the most common as we, we would expect is the injection site reaction which occur in 80% of uh, capotegravir participants, but only 2.2% uh, discontinued the injectable due to this injection-related adverse event. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on that. I'm sure that uh, Landovitz will do it, uh, Dr. Landovitz, but just to show that regarding grade two adverse events, some differences regarding the, the kidney, or, and in favor of, of carbotegravir. And uh, regarding grade three and plus uh, adverse events, no differences. Uh, looking at the weight, also an increase of weight with carbotegravir, or a median of 1.3 kilos, which was statistically significant a difference with the 10 of the F FTC group. But we look at the HPTN 077, we didn't observe these differences on increase of weight. So uh, do we have new drugs for PrEP on the horizon, which could have less toxicity. But there is a new drug, interesting drug. It's a new trans trans translocation inhibitor. It's the Islatravir, which could be uh, used as an implant for 12 months using the same technology as the next plan, which is a uh, contraceptive, or uh, by a monthly oral dose also for, for PrEP. We have some data on safety of this new drug. This is a phase one uh, clinical trial with healthy volunteers, 16. Uh, some of them received the Slatravin by an implant and other placebo for placebo. And the results uh, regarding safety are this. 
uh, as we could expect uh, with like with other implants the hematoma and pain was were common very frequent but uh, when we look at the, the general safety regarding the vital science ECG and safety laboratory studies no clinically significant differences between isolatravir and placebo were observed so also uh, we could expect a, a safe option for breath other options uh, for instance the uh, vaginal uh, films containing HIV and herpes virus monoclonal antibodies. This study was presented in the last conference also, and it was shown that this option was safe and well tolerated, and also could be used as a multipurpose technology for HIV and, and other STIs, and also as a contraceptive. And also there are studies on the pivoting vaginal film, studies the FAME O2B, and also showing a, a good uh, safety profile. And uh, last, talking about uh, new options for PrEP, uh, but specifically on safety, because I know that the next presentation is about new options. So the broadly neutralizing antibodies, and specifically these uh, AMP studies, uh, uh, implemented this, the HHVTN704 implemented on 2,700 MSN women, they received this BRCO1 plus uh, antibody or a placebo, and results not, are not yet presented, but no toxicity expected. Uh, it's, it's true that there is concern about development of antibodies against them and loss of efficacy, and also concern about the emergence of resistance, but we'll see, we'll have to see. And this is the study implemented uh, among women, the HVTN. 703, still waiting for results. So let's go to the resistance uh, issue and risk of resistance to PrEP. Is it that high? Well, evidence suggests that selection for HIV drug resistance with PrEP is infrequent and most likely to occur when PrEP is used during uh, uh, undiagnosed acute HIV infection. Breakthrough infections during PrEP use with high adherence are possible, but appear to be rare, really rare. This, in this article, uh, the author look at the risk of resistance to PrEP, and the, one of the conclusions is that the resistance to TDF for FTC is infrequently selected by PrEP if started before HIV infection has occurred. But it's much more common when uh, it started during uh, undiagnosed uh, acute infection. And in this table, you can see that the, uh, if the infection occurs after the enrollment, the incidence of resistance is low and it's mainly to the FTC, you can see to 6%. But when the uh, prep, when the acute infection occurs at enrollment, then this uh, resistance is much more frequent and can be up to 41 percent and we have also data from the discover study uh, there were 23 uh, zero conversions in the study so far and uh, in five for these zero conversions there was uh, this mutation the m184v but in four uh, four were suspected baseline infections and one had low drug levels by dbs this is uh, a study presented by Don Colby in the last great conference also. Uh, they have a lot of experience with PrEP at the Thai Red Cross in Bangkok. They have from 3,000 3, PrEP users. And they do a qualitative, a pool qualitative HIV RNA test, which can detect most but not all acute uh, HIV infections prior to starting PrEP. And they have observed that the risk of development uh, increases with time on PrEP and it would be low if uh, this time on PrEP is less than 15 days but high if it's more than four weeks. The most common as we know is the uh, M184 and the, they say that there is a low risk for resistance to TDF when PrEP is taken for less than five weeks. So can we reduce this risk of resistance to PrEP? Well, we could use drugs with higher genetic barrier or novel formulations of PrEP, which can facilitate adherence. 
like cabotegravir that could be expected to be protective against the strains of HIV that are resistant to TDF and FTC because it does not target the same HIV enzymes. But if we look back again to the HPTN083 study, uh, we see that there were five cell conversions about cabotegravir participants who receive continuous and on-time cabotegravir injections. Mm, the investigators don't know very well why. They say that per-infection drug concentrations and resistant profiles need to be further explored. So can we reduce it? Well, because long-acting cabotegravir has a long life, half-life, people who discontinue PrEP could have a long period along the pharmacokinetic kinetic the tail with low drug levels, which might potentially increase the selection of resistance to this to this drug. That's why after this continuation of, of, of PrEP with cabotegravir, if risk of infection persists, oral PrEP with FTC TDF or FTC TAF should be recommended for one year. And regarding vaginal rings containing dapivirin, there was no detected uh, dapivirin specific resistant mutations among these women who participated in these studies. And it's possibly because that the low plasma concentrations of dapivirin, which achieves high local tissue concentrations, might reduce selection pressure for drug resistance after the HIV acquisition. And like cabotegravir, dapivirin is suspected to be active also against strains with TDF or FTC resistance. This is what uh, uh, Don Colby and, and their colleagues at the Bangkok Red Cross do. If uh, the, the PrEP client has had any high risk behavior within the previous 30 days, they start uh, with three drugs, like a post-exposure prophylaxis for four weeks. And after four weeks, if the HIV uh, screening is negative, then PrEP is prescribed. And they say that since then, since uh, early 2018, no new cases of HIV infections in PrEP initiators have been detected. And uh, some conclusions. Uh, we know that PrEP may select for drug resistant HIV, but to date, incidence of resistance has been low, very low. And the greatest risk for persons with unrecognized recent infection who initiated PrEP, the FTC resistance more likely to emerge than TDF resistance, although we know that some cases of dual resistance has been reported and the prolonged sale of long-acting formulations might facilitate the emergence of resistance in persons infected after stopping PrEP. And the prevalence of drug-resistant HIV strains needs to be monitored as PrEP is a scale up. And lastly, that the benefits of preventing HIV infections with uh, PrEP far outweighs the risk of drug-resistant infection as long as PrEP is not started in persons with undiagnosed HIV infection. And that's all. Thank you very much, you, and uh, I'll be here for questions. Thank you. Dr. Cole, thank you very much for your presentation. For you, all the people in the audience, please, uh, you know, send us uh, your questions. Our chat box is still open for them. And our next speaker is Dr. Rafael Landovitz from University of California, Los Angeles, USA. He works as an HIV clinician and a clinical investigator at UCLA. And his research interests include HIV prevention, including pre and post exposure prophylaxis. So his presentation is called PrEP, a new delivery system. What does the future hold? Dr. Landovitz? Hello. Thank you for the invitation to speak to this group about PrEP and new delivery systems. What does the future hold? These are my disclosures. I'm going to begin by, by very briefly re reviewing the data for oral TDF FTC PrEP before launching into a discussion of novel delivery mechanisms and agents. I suspect that everyone uh, uh, on this conference is well aware of the randomized data 
to support the use of both daily and on-demand or 2-1-1 TDF FTC prep, beginning with the 2010 seminal IPREC study demonstrating proof of concept of uh, TDF FTC based prep having a 42% in the final analysis reduction in HIV incidence compared to placebo for MSM and transgender women offered the active product. The subsequent studies went on to initially confuse but ultimately confirm the efficacy of TDF FTC prep across a wide variety of populations and circumstances. In the lower right corner of this screen are the results of the IPERGAY study, which also confirmed the uh, on-demand use of TDF FTC for PrEP for MSM in a study conducted in France and Canada, demonstrating an 86% reduction of the active TDF FTC product compared to placebo for on-demand or pericoital administration of this same agent. More recently, the US FDA, in response to the DISCOVER study, a Gilead-sponsored randomized active controlled trial of TAF FTC compared to TDF FTC, was granted regulatory approvals. As many in this room are also aware, TAF FTC had previously been shown to be equally effective but safer for treatment of people living with HIV because the TAF moiety um, uh, uh, hydrolyzes to the active tenofovir product at 90% lower rates in blood plasma compared to TDF FTC, allowing lower levels of free tenofovir to bathe bones and kidneys, resulting in a more salutary safety profile. Um, in contrast, um, TAF FTC has 90% higher tenofovir levels intracellularly, allowing it to maintain therapeutic activity. The question, of course, was would that activity uh, translate into preventive efficacy uh, for uh, at-risk populations? The DISCOVER study randomized gay men or transgender women one-to-one -to, -one to either active TAF FTC daily or active TDF FTC daily and followed participants um, until uh, all participants had uh, reached 48 weeks and half of the participants had reached 96 weeks. Um, the primary results as well as the here showing a non priority result um, for TAF FT. Demonstrating that TAF FTC has significant prophylactic activity um, in MSM and transgender women. In the cover trial, the participants randomized TAF FTC shown on this slide in green at both 48 and 96 weeks had more favorable findings at the spine and total hip on DEXA evaluations compared to those randomized to TDF FTC. Although importantly, although with short-term follow-up, there was not a difference in clinical fracture outcomes. In terms of renal safety, similar to what was seen in the, the treatment literature, extreme renal function were also more favorable for TAF FTC compared to TDF FTC. Although again, there was not a clinic, uh, statistically significant difference in clinical outcomes between the arms, at least with this amount of short-term follow-up. One of the most challenging aspects in the United States today of prescribing PrEP is a discussion of which agent to prescribe. You can see here on a slide that I have shamelessly stolen from Julia Marcus, now at Harvard Medical School, formerly of the Kaiser Foundation, um, that the size of the tablets is significantly different. This can be an important distinguishing characteristic, particularly for adolescent populations who be, may be challenged by the size of the TDF FTC tablet. You can see that we have data for TAF FTC for MSM and transgender women only. We do not yet have any data for heterosexual individuals or people who inject drugs. 
and you can see the differences in bone mineral density and glomerular filtration rate between the two agents depicted here in the lime green and orange bars towards the bottom of your screen. However, it's also important to notice that um, the TDF FTC arm um, had um, uh, uh, more uh, of uh, a beneficial effect on LDL lipids compared to TAF FTC, and that the TAF FTC was also associated by about a one kilogram increase in body weight over the first year of observation. I think it's important to uh, mention all of these risks and benefits together in discussing which PrEP agent might be preferable for a given uh, individual in a clinical setting. In terms of future options for both products and delivery systems, there are many exciting products and delivery systems that are in early stages um, of investigation, more mature stages of study and investigation, and even some that have recently received regulatory approvals. I'm first going to mention long-acting injectable cabotegravir, which recently was presented um, at AIDS 2020 um, as having statistically superior preventive efficacy compared to daily oral TDF FTC in the HPTN 083 study. The study design is shown on this slide in which participants who were HIV uninfected but at increased risk of acquiring HIV at 43 sites in seven countries were randomized either to the cabotegravir intervention shown in orange on this slide or the TDF FTC intervention shown in blue on this slide. Participants underwent a uh, double blind, double dummy introduction of their active study product um, for five weeks orally to establish safety and tolerability, and then a direct injectable to oral comparison for a total of three years. Participants who stopped early, any of the injectable products were had the pharmacokinetic tail of the injectable product covered with a year of daily oral TDF FTC, which was provided in open label fashion. These are the primary results of that study, where in the cabotegravir arm, there were 13 incident infections for an overall incidence rate of 0.41 per 100 person years. And in the TDF FTC daily arm, um, 39 infections for an incidence rate of 1.22 per 100 person years. This resulted in a hazard ratio of 0.34, which was not only um, uh, uh, within the non-inferiority boundary, but excluded 1.0 for a superiority result, and also the pre-specified study alternative hypothesis of a hazard ratio of 0.75, so a definitive superiority result for the cabotegravir arm. The, the, uh, the cabotegravir is awaiting results of a sister study being performed in cisgender women in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's anticipated for regulatory submissions in the next year. I think many in this, uh, on this call have, uh, have also uh, been aware that a monthly depivirine ring for vaginal protection um, uh, uh, for women uh, was shown to have approximately 30% preventive efficacy in two randomized placebo-controlled phase three trials, although follow-up open label studies suggest approximately 50% risk reduction with use in an open label context, um, and recently received European Medicines Association regulatory approvals and is currently under US regulatory review. Um, additional studies of multi-purpose technology rings and rings that are able to last longer than one month are also in progress. This expands our notion of PrEP to PrEP 3.0, as I like to call it. We've moved past PrEP 1.0 and PrEP 2.0 to include these exciting agents, which will hopefully be re uh, regularly available and in implementation and scale up in the not too distant future. I'd also like to bring the audience's attention to some exciting new agents and delivery systems, which are currently in earlier stages of development. Gilead Sciences is developing lenacapavir, a first-in-class HIV capsid inhibitor for, um, for use uh, as part of HIV ART regimens for people living with HIV, as well as a preventive agent. It, it operates um, through inhibition of multiple capsid-dependent functions that are essential for viral replication. 
and has been shown to have about a two log reduction as monotherapy in people living with HIV with 10 days of administration across, across a wide dosing range. I'd also, uh, additionally, it's worth noting that uh, that agent, which is to be administered subcutaneously, recently demonstrated pharmacokinetics that could make it administered as infrequently as every six months. Islatravir, um, uh, 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 currently orally um, from Merck, is also a first-in-class HIV nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, or NRTTI, that also is being developed both for HIV therapeutics and for HIV prevention. Perhaps most excitingly for this talk is um, it is also not only being developed as a once monthly oral tablet, which is currently in phase two trials, but also as an implant, which is based on Merck's Implanon and Nexplanon platform, which of course they have developed for uh, female contraception, um, and is widely available um, on a global scale. Using this same polymer technology, the ability to, um, uh, to co-formulate um, eslatrovir uh, with or without hormonal contraceptives um, provides a, a unique opportunity for a new delivery system TDF FTC prep has set an extremely high bar for preventive effectiveness. Both daily and on demand or 211 dosing work. The 211 dosing, it's important to note, does have WHO endorsement at this point, although there is no US FDA approval for that use. Um, more options are anticipated to allow user choice and be more congruent with sexual activity. That 211 dosing is limited to data to remember, and they are prescribed and monitored identically, which is a major barrier to clinicians feeling comfortable with providing it. TAF FTC prep may be useful in specific situations, such as people who with existing or at high risk for renal dysfunction or known or suspected osteopenia or osteoporosis, or for people unable to tolerate um, the larger pill side of size of TDF FTC. Again, importantly, at the current time, we only have um, efficacy data for TAF FTC as a prep agent in a daily context and for MSM or transgender women. Again, um, uh, the WHO and IAS USA guidance do endorse 211 uh, dosing or oral do uh, dosing that's daily for MSM um, uh, as first line. The CDC in the US still recommends only da daily oral TDF FTC, but importantly, more options are in advanced stages of development, including the depivirine ring, long acting injectable cabotegravir, and hopefully lenacapavir and islatravir. In the future, we also hope to be able to have um, uh, topical patches, which may be able to deliver some of these agents in a more um, clinically acceptable and discreet um, delivery system. Thank you very much for your attention. And after the question and answer session, which will follow the remaining talks of this session, please feel free to uh, ask any remaining questions by emailing me at this email address. Again, thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank Dr. Landowitz for his presentation. And now I would like to open the Q&A session. You can ask the speakers uh, for, you know, uh, for uh, all the related questions. You can use our chat box to send the messages. And I can start with the first one uh, by Alejandra Urioste from Argentina. I've received it uh, during the first uh, presentation uh, by Dr. Del Amo. The question is, which were the principal obstacles to access PrEP during SARS-CoV uh, COVID pandemic? What can we do to change the reality in uh, 2021? But you know, any of the speakers can react to this question if you want, please, Dr. Delamo. Thank you, David, and thank you, Alejandra, for your question. The topic of my talk obviously was not facts because it's a very recent 
issue and there are not that many publications as you can see in the presentation there are two papers addressing interruptions of prep um, uptake in one in australia and another one in brazil and i suggest you read the brazilian paper by brenda hockland and colleagues in the brazilian journal of infectious diseases whereby they recommend the use of telemedicine sending pills uh, sending prescriptions digital prescriptions on hiv self-testing to facilitate prep continuation uh, we don't really have a lot of experience of what has happened on prep implementation where i am currently based at the ministry of health in spain because as you've already seen prep implementation in spain still um, um, still has a, a way to go but i suggest that my other colleagues who are more involved in daily management of prep uh, uptake during the covid pandemic i'm sure they have very interesting insights yes hi thank you and yeah julia uh, uh we what we did uh, during the lockdown uh, in, in in the community center in barcelona prep point was to ask people whether they operated users whether they uh, needed so that they uh, keep on having sex and we, we, as we know that uh, some people uh, had sex during the lockdown and what we did was to to send uh, the medication uh, and also we sent uh, an auto test for hiv because we we, we think that it's important to, to monitor also the, the, as i said in my presentation no uh, to uh, make sure that we don't have a zero conversion during the prep and that's why we send the, the, this uh, all together not drugs and the, cell, and the auto test for HIV no? and then we did a follow-up visit with a phone call and uh, they ah, and they sent us the result of the rapid test the, uh, the picture of the that we, we did the phone call for, for a follow-up no? and it, it worked pretty well uh, because people could uh, keep on taking the, the prep so there was no uh, any disruption and uh, some of them stop it and they say no I, I, I don't need it right now but the majority said that they didn't uh, need it but uh, say that around one quarter of them were uh, were asking for for uh, for the prep for medication yeah so I think that new formulas uh, have to be uh, worked out because the situation has changed uh, a lot uh, or can change in our provision or health services provision and we we, we, ha we have to find uh, new ways of delivering prep and in order to ensure that people have access and uh, to, to to prep mm -hmm. thank you very much for your input uh, may i personally ask you do you have any data about you know the potential influence of COVID for the new candidates of PrEP in in your settings? Because you know in my country we've seen, uh, for example, a drop in number of people being tested for for HIV, and I expect that you know for people who are already on PrEP, uh, it's just a question of logistics, etc., uh, prescription, uh, and so on but that it can have significant influence to those who are thinking about to to start the the follow-up care or you know to, to become a prep user and uh, you know the, the availability uh, or the epidemiological situation could affect this do you have any practical experience in that if i may comment i think the situation in spain has to be um contextualized because as i was mentioning spain has only included public funding for prep and reimbursement in late 2019 so 2020 was supposed to be prep implementation year and then we had covid so that meant that for uh, autonomous regions that had to implement this locally spain is a very decent has a very decentralized healthcare system so it's up to the regions to implement these programs. So some regions 
were ahead, like Catalonia, and particularly in Barcelona, checkpoint with people like Pep Coll, uh, who really has been a leader in the implementation. So for those settings where things were ongoing, I'm sure COVID has not helped and they had to develop new strategies to cope with it. But for some other regions, this meant that they've not really started. So we have different levels, whether whereas COVID has really delayed implementation of planned COVID programs, and in another place it has slowed down already functioning prep programs for the reasons that we've all discussed, people not uh, requiring prep, like in this Australian study that I was mentioning up to 25% of previous PrEP users stopped using daily PrEP or switched to on-demand PrEP to situations where we really needed the stamina to implement the program. And unfortunately, this has not happened. Thank you. I think it's, it's interesting also, you know, the, in the US context, there's, there's two large differences to the European context, of course. Um, although we've had a raging COVID epidemic, we have not been subjected to, um, you, you know, uh, nationwide lockdowns to assist with control um, due to various political forces. And um, so we really haven't seen very many um, overall challenges in people coming in for PrEP visits. There are different, um, uh, as, in, uh, as in Spain, um, autonomous uh, government regions, states, or counties where there has been more aggressive lockdowns imposed. And we have heard that there are um, challenges to people coming in in those cases. And the US CDC has been reluctant to endorse extension of the recommended three month testing interval, um, even in those contexts. So we have sort of been relegated to doing things that are either outside of recommendations. Um, or a lot of remote telehealth sending medications, which are then complicated by the private insurance system and people's ability to leverage um, medication and laboratory services, and also shortages of testing supplies for STDs and even um, HIV testing reagents because of the, um, the multi-purposing of them for, for COVID testing. So um, they've been slightly different, but parallel challenges as well in the US. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Landovitz, I have also one question for you. You are speaking about uh, using of, of tough FTC uh, in, in PrEP, which is quite exotic and unavailable in, in Europe yet. So uh, may you specify a little bit, you know, the algorithm you're using, or it's just the TDF FTC reimbursed and the TAF uh, version must be paid by the patient. Uh, can you clarify this a little bit? Yeah, no, thanks for that question. Um, it's very complicated. Um, you know, um, until just recently in the US, both were only available as brand name products. Neither was, had a generic counterpart um, and both cost approximately the same. There was some private insurance variability on if they required what we call a prior authorization for the use of TAF FTC, for example, demonstration of, a, of renal dysfunction or pre-existing bone disease, but largely payers were willing um, to cover either one. Um, I've had a number of patients come in requesting it because the marketing um, around TAF FTC has focused, and in the US we have direct-to-consumer marketing. Um, there, there's um, uh, marketing directed that it's that it's a safer option. So some people have come in uh, requesting it or called requesting it. And my approach has been to have a conversation with someone where you lay out what's known about the sensitive biomarkers of renal function changes and DEXA um, uh, bone changes that don't have clinical correlates at this time, albeit with short-term follow-up, and then the LDL and weight changes. Um, and it's been, after that conversation, it's been pretty rare that someone actually has decided um, to go on the TAF FTC product after a full explanation of the various risks and benefits. Now TDF FTC in the US is generic, and now it's going to be a much more difficult conversation as payers may force people into one bucket or, or the other. So this is new for us. I realize the majority of the world 
has had generic TDF FTC for a long time, but this is new for us. All right, thank you very much. So I would like to thanks once again to all our speakers for your participation in, uh, uh, in a discussion.